Alrighty, welcome everyone to episode number 802 of No DQ and A video right here on NoDQ.com as well as the YouTube channel and No DQ and A videos affiliate RingsideNews.com. Before I get to your questions, real quick, here is Skeleton Hulk Hogan with the NoDQ.com championship belt, which you can purchase at Etsy.com slash shop slash bad billy j and that is the letter j not j a y check him out you can also purchase other championship belts many to choose from and you can also customize your own championship belt now that i got that out of the way let's get down to your questions today first one comes from wreck it beckett hey Aaron, what did you think of the extreme rules go home show i found it pretty good and enjoyed the women closing the show Overall, I enjoyed Raw this week. I know a lot of people were critical of it. I felt that in terms of building up Extreme Rules, I felt that WWE did a good job. The matches were pushed. It's clear what the entire card is. And I will say that I am looking forward to Extreme Rules, although, as I mentioned in the predictions video with Jeff Meacham, I do feel the main event is very predictable, but I will say that WWE has done a solid job building up that match and getting fans to care about it. It feels like a main event match. It feels like it's worthy of headlining that pay-per-view. That is a positive. And the other matches are interesting. You have Chris Jericho versus Dean Ambrose in an Asylum match. You have Charlotte and Natalia in the submissions match with Ric Flair banned from ringside. And of course... The match I'm looking forward to the most, the IC title Fatal 4-Way. All these matches, in my opinion, have been built up well. And I got this question here from Nicholas E. Myers. What is WWE doing with Gallows and Anderson? I do not understand the logic behind the way they are being booked. It's typical Vince McMahon booking. Vince has to make it clear to the casual fans that WWE is superior to New Japan Pro Wrestling. Same thing happened with WCW. Same thing happened with ECW. Vince has never been a fan of having outside talent going over his homegrown talent. And Gallows and Anderson, when they came in, they were considered to be outsiders from New Japan Pro Wrestling. And the announcers made this very clear on commentary that they're from New Japan. And WWE did all the hyping up with the social media showing the photos of Anderson and Gallows with AJ Styles in the Bullet Club. So that's what I think it's all about. WWE wants to make sure that the homegrown stars are protected and look the strongest. And in this case, it's the Usos that are the homegrown talent. Now, as far as the match at Extreme Rules goes... This match was announced after Jeff and I did our predictions video, so I will go ahead and say that even though they've been losing a lot, I do feel that Gallows and Anderson will win at Extreme Rules. They've lost several matches now to the Usos, and if it was me, I would have done this way differently. I think with Gallows and Anderson, they should have come in and been dominant outsiders. I mean, think about it. If Hall and Nash had jobbed out to a bunch of people a month into their run, the NWO would have never gotten as strong as it got. The NWO became huge because the Outsiders were absolutely dominant and destroying everybody. And I think WWE could have done an effective invasion angle with Anderson and Gallows and the Bullet Club trying to take over the company. There could have been something there, but that's already done with. So now... Anderson and Gallows are just two guys on the roster, and hopefully they do get the win at Extreme Rules. If they don't, not really looking good for their future. All right, this one comes from Marcus S. Did the contract signing between Charlotte and Natty deserve to, to be the main event on the go-home show to Extreme Rules? It doesn't really matter one way or another, and... The fact is, the ratings have been dropping in the third hour. Maybe WWE's attitude is that the third hour is not important anymore, and it's it's best to have the main event segments in the middle of the show. 
The problem with that is you really do not want to get fans in the habit of not tuning into the third hour. WCW made a huge mistake in 1999 when they stopped putting emphasis on the first hour of Nitro. They would do various skits and segments, throwaway segments during the first hour. One time they had a whole hour of Nitro, the first unopposed hour with no Raw competition. They just did a bunch of skits and promos, no matches whatsoever, no storylines, and WCW lost that audience and never gained those viewers back. And WWE could be in a situation where if they do not make the third hour important, fans might just permanently give up on it, and that could be bad for WWE in the long term when it comes to television ratings. So it's a little bit dangerous water to tread. I think that doing Charlotte and Natty at the end, it does help the women's division and give it some more credibility. But at the same time, it wasn't like it was a must-see segment. Now, if, if WWE had a really good idea for the women for the main event segment, then go ahead and do it. But you want to do something that's shocking and compelling, something that people will talk about. And really, if you missed that contract segment, you did not miss much. All right, this one comes from Mark. Hey, Aaron, with the women closing out Raw with a good segment, do you think that we'll finally see, that, see them in a pay-per-view main event? Maybe. I mean, I've touched on this before. I think that maybe one day WWE will experiment and do a women's match as the main event of a minor pay-per-view, like a Battleground or one of those pay-per-views, Night of Champions maybe. But... I do not see WWE having a pay-per-view like SummerSlam close out with a women's match unless, this is something I've mentioned before, if Ronda Rousey comes into WWE, maybe at that point there will be a major women's match headlining a major WWE pay-per-view. That's really the only way I see it happening anytime soon, if ever. Alright, this one comes from Sean T. Flick. Thoughts on the Asylum match? I would have preferred the return of the Lion's Den. I'm fine with the Asylum match. I think it's funny that WWE is using a concept from TNA, the lethal lockdown match with the weapons on top of the steel cage. But it is something different in the world of WWE, and I like the idea of the straight jacket being there. I actually think that they should have just done a straight jacket match, but that's just my personal opinion. They got the weapons out there. You had... You had Moppy, you had the son of Mitch out there. So it should be an entertaining match regardless of what they do or what the stipulation is. So I really don't have any strong opinion on the stipulation match just as long as I'm entertained. This one comes from Jishnu. Hey Aaron, what are your thoughts on Luke Harper being world champion? I think he has got the goods to be a great champion. Not with his current gimmick. I doubt that Luke Harper, with that look, with the wife beater and the jeans, is going to be a WWE World Champion. If he changes up his look a bit and really evolves the character beyond just being one of the disciples of Bray Wyatt, then I would not rule it out. A lot of people consider him to be the most talented member of the Wyatt family. And who knows, he very well could go on to be the, the most successful long-term member of the group. But right now, he has to worry about recovering from his injury, and he won't be back until the end of the summer or the early fall. So there's not really a point in speculating on it too much, how far he's going to go. It's, it's really a big question mark right now, what he'll be like when he returns and how far he'll really go long-term. But... If he can come back as good as he was before, then I could definitely see him going far in WWE beyond the Wide Family gimmick if he's able to evolve his character. All right, this one comes from Angelo C. Hey, Aaron, haven't you noticed most major injuries occur at WWE live events? Why do you think this has been such a trend lately? I think it's just a, it's just a coincidence. You have to keep in mind, first off, that there are more live events than television tapings. There's sometimes three live events and only two television tapings. That's part of it. And also stuff like the European tour, when you have guys going out there ten nights in a row. It's, it's, a, very, 
it's a very overwhelming tour at times for people being gone for so long and just one night after another it, it's very physically demanding and guys get burned out i mean that that certainly plays a role in it and i also just think it's been bad luck guys have just gotten hurt in a short period of time and sometimes a long period of time can go by without anybody getting hurt or very few people getting hurt so it, it's just a matter of timing and luck and there are some other factors that do play a role in it um you know it's just I think for the most part, it's just WWE has been unlucky this year with injuries. All right, this one comes from at AJ Level Up. Do you think Dolph Ziggler will ever regain the push he had when he was a world champion or his days as a top card guy are over? I do not see Dolph Ziggler winning the world title. I think that his best days are behind him. And I say that because WWE is focusing on younger talent and new people. Dolph Ziggler has been part of the company for a decade now, and he had his moment. He had his moments. He was world champion. He got his pushes. He won money in the bank. But at the end of the day, he was never seen as a guy that would be at the top in WWE. And... Many would argue he deserved better. Some would say he was a very talented wrestler, but he wasn't the best. He wasn't the best promo. He wasn't the best overall performer. It's all debatable. Everyone has an opinion on it, but I think looking at it realistically, he had his time, and there's so many other guys coming in, so many guys waiting in NXT for the big opportunity. I just don't see it happening for Dolph Ziggler. All right, this one comes from Scotty C. How is it logical that WWE releases stars like Sandow and Barrett yet push Primo and Epica who have always failed to get over? I think it could be because of the last name, Cologne, because they have the family pedigree that WWE is more invested in those guys and feels that those guys have more mileage as a team and being an act in the company. It could just be politics as well. I mean, with Sando, maybe he didn't know the right person. Maybe Barrett did not know the right person. And Primo and Epico do. It, it, it could be as simple as that. All right, this one comes from Nicholas. What do you think about WWE announcing dates for the return of superstars like John Cena and Seth Rollins? I'm fine with it. I know some people like the element of surprise and having people return suddenly, but it is strategic by WWE to do it this way, announcing it in advance, and it can be very effective in building up interest in the product and getting people talking about it and, and creating anticipation. You look back at when Triple H returned in 2002, that was announced well in advance with the video packages. and. It proved to be very effective with Triple H coming back as a top babyface and going on to WrestleMania. That worked out for Triple H and his storyline. You can get something out of building up a major return like John Cena or Seth Rollins, especially for someone like Rollins who, if the plan is to make him a top babyface, doing the video packages and building him up would be the best way to go. Now, WWE has not officially announced Seth Rollins' return. That is something that's being speculated on. John Cena, I think that's being done to pop a rating and, and try to build up some excitement about WWE heading into the summer that WWE can say, hey, look, our big star is coming back. Things are going to pick up. Make sure you tune in Memorial Day to see the summer period of WWE really catch fire. That could be what WWE is trying to accomplish there and, and build up the ratings and get the viewership up. All right, this one comes from So Hale. With rumors that more releases will come after Extreme Rules, who do you think are the next bunch of WWE stars to be let go? I'm really not a fan of speculating on which people will lose their jobs. It's just not something I like to do. But I will say that the people you're not seeing on television are most likely the top candidates to be let go. And you look at guys like Ryback and Adam Rose. 
Adam Rose, I could see not being released until his legal case is cleared up one way or another. With Ryback, it, it's pretty safe to assume that he's gone, although they may just allow his contract to run out. And just any guy that's not being used is a guy that very well could be on the chopping block. If it was me, if I was going to release people, it would not be the talent. I would get rid of some of the writers, although maybe there are some talented writers in WWE and they just have the handcuffs on and aren't able to really be as creative as they could be. But whoever is responsible for the lack of creativity on WWE television, those are the people I would get rid of. And if that's Vince, then I would I would push Vince aside and put Triple H in charge full time, but we all know that's not going to happen. All right, this one comes from Michael at MMA Mike. How should WrestleMania 33 be booked? Years time from now, what would be your best card to put together with a healthy roster and new stars? I would love to see the Shield triple threat, although I feel I feel like I've been saying that for years now and I'm going to be saying it for years to come. It would be cool to see a Shield triple threat match at WrestleMania with those three guys and maybe let Ambrose win so he can have his big moment at WrestleMania. I'd love to see Brock Lesnar in a meaningful match. Something bigger and better than Lesnar versus Ambrose. I think you should do Lesnar versus Orton or even Lesnar versus Samoa Joe if you build up Joe. Just give Lesnar a really strong opponent for WrestleMania. That's something I would like to see. Maybe John Cena versus Undertaker, which I've also been talking about for years. Maybe even doing a submission match between those two because John Cena never quits and Undertaker will he really give up at WrestleMania. That would be an extremely intriguing match to see at WrestleMania. Maybe that could be Undertaker's send-off. Uh, so those would be my top three matches right there. And make sure you have Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens in a prominent match. Maybe do a one-on-one -on -one match with those guys at WrestleMania since they did not do it this year. And maybe Cesaro in a high-profile match. Maybe Cesaro versus Orton. Uh, those are just some ideas for matches right there. Right now, it's still too early to really, to really put together a strong WrestleMania card. But those are some of the matches I would like to see personally. Alright, that'll wrap it up for this edition of No DQ and a video. Thanks as always for watching. Real quick, that previous question. AJ Styles versus Nakamura at WrestleMania. That would be incredible. But thank you all for watching No DQ and a video today. Subscribe at youtube.com slash no DQ CAW. Also, the alternate URL is youtube.com slash Aaron Rift No DQ. Uh, you can also use that URL as well to access the channel. And of course, make sure you stop by Bad Billy J's Etsy store and grab yourself a nodq.com belt or any belt you damn well feel like. You can go there and grab some belts, support him, and stay tuned to nodq.com for Extreme Rules coverage, and I will see you guys next time.